actually had a response to the Ethanpitol and also a question. I was on the Ethanpitol for about seven months and developed um, neuropathy from it um, in my hands. Um, and just last week found out that I may have, which I've never heard of, eye neuropathy. So, but it was replaced with Avalox and have had four clear sputums negative since being on the Avalox. So that's uh, been a substitute for me, along with Rifampin and Azithromycin. I think the three now. Everybody should know that the eye disease, uh, blurry vision, and actually you can have blindness. And I think most of the neuropathy, but not all of it, is a toxicity. It's not an allergy. It's not like a rash. I say it's not like a rash with penicillin. A little penicillin, a lot of penicillin, you still get a rash. This is a toxicity, meaning the amount of the drug in your body is more than your nerves can handle. One of the reasons for going to three times weekly um, was specifically issues related to eye disease and how common they were in the older population and how difficult it was to assess, are your eyes blurry? Um, there was a published paper that compared about 150 patients on three times weekly and about an equal number of patients on daily, treated for MAC, standard doses, 5% of the patient on standard daily doses treated for MAC got a thanatol toxicity. No one in that study on three times weekly got toxicity. I'm, but I will say I've seen a few cases of peripheral neuropathy that develop very quickly. And I, it doesn't go away. No. I, I have to believe there's something different about those patients. They have some. It's not very common, uh, and generally, the two of those can go together. You can have both eyes and peripheral neuropathy. But again, it's not a very common no. event. Um, in, in our experience, dropping a family doll um, happens in no more than 1% of the patients on the drug. It's just not, I was, I was not three times a week, it's just not very common. Yeah, I was on five days. Yeah. Five days? Yeah. You're on daily therapy. Yeah. But as I say, being replaced with the Avalox, um, I've been negative, so that has come. Um, my question was, I'm hearing a lot about, um, you know, environmental factors. Um, I'm here with my sister, who is also a uh, MAC uh, And I wondered how many um, siblings, if any, do you treat? We also have a, an older sibling who has just recently been um, diagnosed with like early stage bronchitis. Um, we have specifically tried to recruit um, families like yours uh, where there's more than one family member affected. Again, uh, mainly with an interest in trying to understand whether they're genetic risks. So we follow about 30 families. Um, that, that have more than one, usually sibling, sometimes it's a mother-daughter pair uh, in the families that they affect. Some of the families have multiple members. Hey, we've, we've looked at a, a small number of MAC isolates from siblings and mothers that never had a match, but they often don't live in the same place, so you wouldn't expect them. If, if any of you doctors were to, to recommend Ethambutol for your patient, would you tell that patient before they started the drug to get a baseline eye test? And if you put a patient on Rifampin, would you also tell them to get a baseline on their, on their hearing? I mean, I usually inquire about when they had their last exam done. Do they have a regular ophthalmologist that follows them? If they don't have one and they haven't been examined in a recent time period, um, I will send them back as a baseline. Um, now, for most, for all of the drugs, we generally do a baseline set of blood tests. 
um, and then repeat those at generally monthly intervals. Um, we do. Well, there's two questions. One, I don't do a baseline hearing test. One of the bigger questions might be with azithromycin for reasons um, evidence that if you use azithromycin in patients who have underlying significant heart disease, um, there is a small but definite risk um, of dying from the azithromycin. So, Dr. I asked Dr. Olivier, my political impression is that coronary disease and bad heart disease is very rare in this population. Um, and I noticed that it wasn't on his list, and so I was curious why. But, so, does anybody here do an EKG before they put their patients on? Don't think we do. And we certainly look for the presence of heart disease. And if they do have heart disease, we try to find a QT interval and try to assess risk. Uh, I, I, I think the, the study, of course, that was uh, upon which all this was based in Tennessee, I believe, uh, was about one out of 30,000 patients were sus suspected of having a, uh, there was some excess deaths of about one out of 30,000. And they tried to narrow it down to patients with cardiac history, and perhaps it was more. But remember, it was patients with who are given as if they're mycin versus um, I think it was I think they compared it might have been amoxicillin, and uh, you know I I kind of have faith in doctors to give as if they're for something a little more serious than amoxicillin if they're talking about respiratory infections and they probably do more likely have amoxicillin but I didn't think they really needed anything you might say so how was that a comparison I I mean I, I personally am a big critic of that kind of Association. I think it's gotten a lot of play. There's some credibility and there's some science that said this might be true. So nobody would ever turn their back on it. So we do look. But I think that the, there's a study, I believe, from Denmark that uh, pretty much says that if you don't have cardiac disease, you know, forget it, it's okay. And maybe if you do, then you pay a little more attention, watch out. A bit. These are incredibly small numbers that they're trying to tease out with, with studies that are not randomized. Oh, yeah, me. Dr. Slogan, uh, this is addressed to you. Um, is there a definitive answer on what we should do with our humidifiers? <laughs> 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 is there a definitive answer on what we should do with our humidifiers? Oh, the definitive answer, as yeah. far as I'm concerned, is don't use them. I, I, I realize that humidifying air can, particularly in the winter when in the east and places uh, where the air dries out, it really is a relief. But I worry that uh, if we, particularly with a freestanding humidifier, you may be transferring organisms. Now, what, what we find is that, and there was something on consumers report about how often do people clean their humidifiers. And normally people just keep refilling them. And if you do that, you end up with a really high number of organisms because they are sitting there in the biofilm in between fillings and they're not dying off. So you really have to rigorously scrub them. Uh, and, and that's for a freestanding one. You scrub it and then at least you're not, you're getting just the organisms that are in the water. Alternatively, you can fill them with boiled water 10 minutes of boiling kills all organisms, including the mycobacteria. So you can fill up the reservoir with boiled water. Um, you can chlorinate it. The chlorination kind of causes problems because you get a chlorine smell in the house, and that's not so good. Then you have to rinse it, and what are you going to rinse it with? So uh, the, ones, the ones on your household system, I think, are a more problematic situation because uh, they may be automatic, they may be going on, uh, you can disconnect them or simply turn the humidifying controls down to nothing. Okay, and then what do we do for drinking water in our house? You said the filters are not good and when we put your water, we don't want to use the <coughs> water. What do you recommend? Um, first, you can boil water again if you're concerned. And the concern, I think, would be more appropriate for anyone who thought they had some kind of reflux. 
because that you're swallowing water and then you could aspirate. Um, now you can get microbiological filters. These are filters, and I have one here that's a shower filter. And this goes on a shower, and it does have a filter that prevents the passage of all organisms, including mycobacteria. We've actually tested these. Um, you can get them for taps as well. You can restrict your use in the house so that you don't use every shower because these are not inexpensive. This, the newer edition now lasts 62 days, two months. It's an improvement over the first ones, I think, were only 14 days. So there's been some substantial improvement in these. Uh, so those can be on water tap. Um, and uh, you can use that water for preparing, preparing food, for drinking. You can use one of these in a shower. You're definitely saying, do not use the water that's Yes, ma'am. The, the system in a refrigerator consists of a line that comes into the refrigerator, a large tank that stores the water and essentially pressurizes it to some extent so it comes through the tap easier. But it's in the back of the refrigerator. Part of it goes through a chilling mechanism, but that water gets warm because if you ever feel the water coming out from, or the air coming out from underneath the refrigerator, it's warm. So when we sampled the whole system, we got large numbers of, of non-tuberculous mycobacteria in that. What about the eyes? Thank you. What about the? Not these eyes here? Yeah, the eyes, uh, and uh, Richard is well aware of the hazards of ice and mycobacteria in ice. I, I'm very worried about the uh, kitchen sink uh, for water. We have some matches and I think uh, I, I think my wife might think otherwise uh, sitting back there, but she believes the correct interpretation of the data is that women should not do dishes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you find those things, Doctor? What do you find that filter? Pardon? Well, Chris, can you stand up, please? This is Chris Connell. He's from PAL Corporation. They have supplied filters to my laboratory for testing. Without any constraints, I might add, I was not told what I what the results were supposed to be or anything like that. Those are available. Chris is here, and uh, so you're free to talk to Chris. I'll, I'll leave some cards. 